join me in giving our speakers a warm welcome to the stage. Hello, everyone. How's it going? It's so great to be here. Thanks, Charlie. So I'm going to introduce Katie Eater, who's here uh, next to me. Katie is 19 years old, uh, and she is the executive director of Future Coalition, which is an organization that is mobilizing youth all over the country on prevention of gun violence, climate action, and voting, registering to vote. And if you didn't know, uh, Future Coalition was the organizing force behind the September 20th climate strikes that happened all over the country, mobilizing 1,300 strikes and over a million people, which was, of course, reverberated around the world with more than 4 million people. Uh, she, Katie also uh, organized and co-founded, sorry, 50 miles more. I wanted to get the number of miles right. I just didn't want to mess that up. Um, and this was an organization dedicated to gun violence, uh, again, mobilizing youth. And right now, am I right to say, Katie, that you're kind of almost just past dead in the middle of your two gap years between high school and going to Stanford University in the fall of 2020? Yes, that, that's correct. Yeah. So welcome, and thanks for being in conversation with me. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and I have the pleasure of uh, introducing, introducing um, Bina Venkatraman, who is a writer and leader who works at the intersection of social projects, uh, progress, emerging technology, and environmental change. Uh, she is the author of a new book, which you're all um, getting to go home with, which is The Optimist Telescope, Thinking Ahead in a Reckless Age. Um, she teaches uh, in MIT's program on science, technology, and society. Uh, she formerly served as the senior advisor for climate change innovation in the Obama White House, uh, where she built partnerships between communities, companies, uh, and government to prepare for climate disasters. Uh, she's a former science journalist for the New York Times and Boston Globe, and in just a few days, we'll start uh, as the new editorial page editor for the Boston Globe. Thank you. So we're going we're gonna to talk about becoming ancestors, or really, I think in a way, we already are ancestors. We are ancestors. We don't necessarily look at ourselves that way, uh, but how do we be better ancestors, I guess, is one of the, the driving questions behind maybe both of our work, especially, I think... Um, it's the lens that I brought to this, but I mean, Katie, I wonder for you, I, you know, how much are you actually looking at your own ancestors, not yourself as an ancestor, and what's your kind of assessment of how things are? Because I, I remember being 19 myself, uh, and I kind of felt, granted it was a different time, I kind of felt like there were adults in the room who were handling things. I would kind of defer to them. I thought there were experts, my teachers, my professors, ex public figures that were kind of solving problems. Uh, I didn't feel, I guess what I've observed in you and in, in the work you're doing is a sense of taking the reins yourself. So what can you say about why you're doing that and sort of how you're looking at your own ancestors at this moment? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, so I think to provide some context around this, an answer to this question um, is to tell you how I first kind of understood what climate change was. Um, in the sixth grade, I took a class where we read An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. Uh, and that book was really the first time I understood that there could be an issue that was so expansive that it could reach farther than just one community or one town. Um, and at the time, I really was, sh you know, I, I thought, you know, how could, how could we not be addressing this? How could everyone not be talking about this? Uh, and I really thought, you know, kind of, I think, being a little bit naive at the time that, oh, people just must not know that this is happening. If people knew about climate change, we'd be doing something. Um, and so that sort of started my journey of wanting to get involved and, and to, you know, kind of be like, you know, we have to talk to people about this. We have to educate people about this. Um, and I think realizing through just the first couple, even like weeks and months of getting involved with the issue and trying to find others to engage with and others who were doing the work and, and others who could support sort of my own journey and wanting to, to, to do something, uh, it was very discouraging to, to find out that actually everyone did know about this or a lot of people did uh, and we weren't doing anything. Um, and I think that that was, you know, it's, it was, I think definitely for me on sort of my own personal journey of, of you know, becoming 
an organizer and an activist or an, and, and a change maker in general, I think um, realizing that you know adults didn't have all the answers and um, you know didn't know how to take the steps necessary in order to solve potentially the greatest existential threat we've ever faced as as a global society, um, which obviously is is a huge thing. And, and do you think that they didn't know or that they just didn't have the will to do it? Which which do you think it is? Do you think it's that they don't know how to solve the how how to solve this problem? Just trying to understand more about what you think the difference is. Yeah, I think um, I think a little bit of both. I think that you know, right now in this moment, we know that the solutions are out there. We know that if we decided to, we could address this problem, and we and we don't have the political will. And so I think right in the, in this moment, you know, the accountability is. Um, it, it, it is about accountability, and it is saying, you know, we all know, and if you aren't, if we all collectively are not taking action in whatever way we can or we are able, then we we need to be held responsible for that. I think on the flip side, for a long time though, that this issue was so daunting to so many that people felt like it couldn't be addressed and couldn't be tackled. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think it is a little bit of both. But I do think now in this moment, you know, we are. Uh, I think adults and young people alike are accountable to every generation that follows. And, you know, I'm actually just turned 20. I'm not 19 anymore, which... Oh, um, sorry. Happy birthday. No, it's okay. <laughs> when, um, when was your birthday? Uh, it was last week, so... Happy um, birthday. But, Mike, maybe we can sing later. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Katie. Happy birthday to you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my, two, my two colleagues here are sitting in the front who know that it's, I, I, I'm no longer a teen activist, so this is a small identity crisis for me. Um, um, but I would love to sort of hear from you as well about, you know, kind of how you talk, I think, you know, you've been able to look at this with such an, you know, clearly in, in a lens of optimism and, and where that, sort of spark came from and how you you first got sort of interested in exploring this concept and 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 through the, the lens that you do. Sure. So I think the optimism I feel is not a sort of optimism that involves sitting back in an armchair and saying, oh, the world's just going to get better and better no matter what we do. It's all fine. I consider myself an engaged optimist, which is the way I define that is to say that we have choices. We actually have choices about what we can do at an individual level at a collective level in businesses and communities and even at the level of society. And, and that's true not just for problems of climate change, but sort of issues of the future. So thinking ahead in our lives, that we have the potential to do this. And I, my research that I did for five years leading to the Optimist Telescope really kind of revealed to me that this idea that there's just a curse of human nature to be short-sighted is a myth. And yes, certainly we carry some of those same traits of the hunter-gatherers on the plane who would just react to whatever uh, beast was was on the horizon or form of prey, but that in fact were also the species that organized farming, that were the species that charted the stars, that put people on the moon, that we are capable of a great deal of foresight. And so I wanted to understand what the ingredients are, what are the choices we have to actually act as if the future matters, and in particular with the problem of climate change, that's something we've needed to do. And, and often I have have sort of diagnosed a sort of lack of imagination, an inability to imagine a better future, which I think speaks to what, what you were talking about when you said, well, people feel this sort of lack of agency. They look, at, look ahead and they see the predictions of sea level rise or refugee crises or of wildfires, and they're experiencing some of that today, of course. And there's a feeling that this doomsday is coming and that we have no choice in the matter. And that is a very, if you look at the cognitive science, that's a very debilitating point of view with which to approach the future. So assuming you're not a person who just doesn't care about the future, which I actually think there are a few people who don't care. I think this is a sort of universal aspiration that's in almost every religion, almost every moral code. It's even embedded in our democratic constitutions and the public trust doctrine. Um, there's some really interesting examples from, from European and, and American history in particular of how this concept actually is part of our aspirations. Uh, but so even though, uh, you know, even those people who care, uh, I think can be very debilitated by the sense that there is no agency. And so I think what it takes is the ability to imagine a future that is not just the status quo, that is not just the doomsday that is being predicted, but a sort of 
a world in which that we can shape, where we have the agency to make those decisions. And I think it's really, it's an honest point of view as well. I think some people will say, well, isn't that Pollyanna when you look at the scientific predictions of, of sea level rise to say that there's something we can do? And in fact, that's not true. There's, there in, if you look at the scientific research on this, there are many scenarios that can play out. And a lot of them depend upon our political will, on our willingness to do things and how we organize ourselves. And it's always going to matter to do more to sort of reduce those emissions. You can always prevent suffering. You can always prevent some of the financial costs the more we do to prevent that. And so I think that message is really important and the details of how we imagine the future are really important. I think it's so fascinating that you come at this from both an, a lens of academia but also a lens of from the media and the perspective of how the media is telling the story of climate change and of, of the climate movement. And something we talk about a lot in the movement is that you know, so often the media does kind of frame climate change as something that is really invoking sort of this paralysis of, oh my gosh, this problem is so, you know, this problem is so huge and, and there's, there's, you know, nothing we can do about it. And um, I think we, as, as organizers and activists, feel sometimes almost, I think, helpless in how that story is being told because we're sort of, we're trying so hard to inject kind of that optimism so how would you, I'm, because I'm about to take on this big media role, it would be really helpful <laughs> if you could share with me and with us sort of what would you, what's the counter narrative that you would rather see the media covering in, in this space? Well, I think it's, you know, one of the things, I think, I think it's kind of, it's obviously multi-layered, but I think that for so long, climate change has been this, this huge kind of unknown thing that is going to destroy our futures and, you know, something that we are fighting against, right? Like this, this idea of, um, you know, we're going to have to leave our homes and there's going to be, you know, in, increased frequency and, and um, intensity of natural disasters and more forest fires and all these things. And what the media is telling us is so, you know, is heavy, it's dark. Um, and that makes people feel like, oh, there's nothing that I can do. And, and the shift that we really want to see is how can we tell the story of what we're fighting for? How can we tell the story of, okay, this is not just an opportunity to, uh, you know, fix the, the atmospheric levels of carbon, um, but really an opportunity to reshape our society as we know it, our global society as we know it, and unite as one planet and one world to, uh, you know, to not just solve, um, you know, the, the issues with the climate itself, but do it through a lens of justice and do it through a lens of equality and um, do it through a lens of of justly transitioning uh, our our society into kind of a, a new generation um, and a new era of what what it means to to be in the in the you know technological and digital age. Um, yeah, I think, but I'm, I, yeah, and I think that what, what we struggled with, so I'd love to hear sort of from you is how we, how we get that across, you know, because so much we, you know, we get, you know, one, one line or one quote or, or one press release, but it's so, you know, it can be constricting in many ways. Well, I think your criticism of the media is fair. Uh, you know, I went to hear the filmmaker Vin Vendor's talk not so long ago, and he talked about how there's a monopoly of the visible and, uh, in the cognitive science, if you read Kahneman and others, this is called the availability bias, the idea that what we see and what we read, especially when it's vivid and colorful, is what we, what we believe is most likely and possible. So if we're constantly reading the negative, vivid scenarios or we're constantly seeing the negative, vivid headlines, we're likely to believe that that's sort of what's possible. And so I think that's a fair, uh, a fair criticism of how this issue has been portrayed. I think... You know, one of the things, these con the concepts of justice, those concepts, uh, they're, while they're very powerful and aspirational, they're also kind of vague. And, and what I do find uh, in, in the examples that I've looked at, for example, I looked at the history of social movements, including the U.S. Civil Rights Movement and the Farm Workers Movement here in California in the 70s, 60s, and 70s. And the success of those movements, if you look at, at what they imagined, it was very concrete. They would imagine uh, better con working conditions in the field, uh, uh, fair wages, uh, integrated schools, in the case of the civil rights movement, integrated buses. Uh, and all of that was, was sort of really something you could, you could envision, you could paint a picture of it. And so one of the things I think about when it comes to climate is, how can we talk to people about just having cleaner, safer neighborhoods? cleaner, safer neighborhoods? Like, what does that look like for you? Can you envision your own community? How does that look? And, and that, can, that can encompass concepts like justice. It can encompass concepts like 
cleaner air and less asthma. Uh, but people need to be able to sort of envision those specifics. And, and we live in a culture and a society where we're, our, most of our effort toward the future is focused on prediction. And I think with algorithmic tools, with data collection, that has become sort of supercharged, though it's a human tendency that goes back to reading Oracle Bones in ancient Greece and all of that. And, and so as we do that, as we predict, the future. I think it's really important that we balance it with imagination because all predictions, as we know, are based on historical precedent and we live in times of unprecedented change where the data we're collecting in the moment might not actually tell us everything that's possible in the future, both from a negative point of view but also from a positive point of view. That's, yeah, I think it's, I, it's interesting the piece about imagination and asking people to sort of in, invoke that imagination when I think a lot of times we, you know, especially for the youth movement, our, our, the story is so much we, you know, why should we be in school? Like we're striking from school because we don't even know that we're going to get to use the education that we gain from school 10 years, 20 years down the line. And so, um, yeah, but I do, I, I, I very much agree that I think that that, that, you know, what is what do we want that future to be if we, you know, like of... Right. But what I think is so interesting about these youth strikes, so I finished, the book went to print before the youth climate strikes of September. The book came out at the end of August. And I was calling for young, listening to more young people at the end of the book and, and sort of the lawsuits that have been coming across. People, uh, young people have been suing governments around the world, including the U.S. government, based on the harm caused by climate change. But sort of the explosive youth strikes of, of late had not taken hold. And one of the things, the reasons I was calling for that is that I think there is an imagination gap from as the older you get to like really think about what's the future going to look like for the next generation? How do I really wrap my head around that? And, and in a way, I think what you've done with these strikes and with this movement is to help all of us to better imagine, you're telling us what the future's gonna be. In a way, you're kind of representatives of that future, bridging that gap. I mean, I wrote about tools like writing a letter to your future self or writing a letter to someone you know, a niece or nephew or kid or god kid or grandkid to be opened in 2050. And that's, a, that's been shown, there's a research team in a group called Dear Tomorrow that's using this tool to sort of help people say like, how do I actually think about 2050? That seems so abstract, especially amid technological change. And so I think it's really powerful in a way what you are doing is bridging that imagination gap by getting in people's faces and saying, I represent the future. Like, this is actually my future. I'm a human being. And I think that's a lot less abstract than sort of looking at uh, a sort of broad-based prediction of 2050, whether you're looking at how AI is going to transform the economy or how the sea level is going to rise. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that's, that's, I think that, you know, what it is this sort of like concreteness of, I think, what we talk about in, in the in the organizing space a lot is that a lot there are these trigger moments that trigger social change. So the women's march was triggered by Trump getting elected. You know, March for Our Lives was triggered by the shooting that happened in Parkland, Florida. And what's interesting about the climate movement is it's something that hasn't necessarily there wasn't one thing right necessarily that has triggered this this movement that that is growing in momentum at a rate that we didn't necessarily see with you know, some of the, the, the social kind of move, or the recent movement moments, um, but that what is also making kind of this, the, the climate crisis itself more concrete is these almost mini trigger moments that we've been witnessing over the last, you know, year, definitely, but the last, you know, decade, um, whether it be the, the forest fires that, you know, I'm sure if you're based in California have been, you know, experiencing for the last few weeks. Um, but, you know, the, the hurricanes, the flooding, the heat waves, you know, all of this people are starting to understand, okay, this is something that's going to impact my life. And then I think what is so powerful about the fact that, that the movement is, is youth led is we're kind of putting it in people's faces and, and, and kind of, in, and also invoking that sort of guilt a little bit and saying, you know, not only now are you seeing the concrete effects of, of the crisis itself, but here are the people, here are the young people that, that those, our futures are going to be, you know, affected disproportionately. Um, so can you talk about, because you're working on engagement, getting people to vote, uh, young people to vote, and you've also been working on gun violence, and you've been working on climate change, what can you say about, I mean, are you more or less optimistic in any of these areas about the level of cha either change you can achieve or engagement you can get on the part of youth? Do you see, and, and maybe voting transcends them, but I'm curious, where do you see, where do you feel more hopeful? 
Yeah, I think that you know what we witnessed in 2018 was, I hope, is is sort of a, uh, an example of or a trial, I guess, of what we are going to see in 2020. Um, in 2018, the youth vote went from 21% to 31% turnout, which um, feels, you know. 31% is still not great, but um, it was historic. It was, uh, you know, the, the highest level of youth turnout in a midterm election in over 25 years. Um, and what, you know, we saw was that young people were going to the polls to vote because of gun violence. That issue-based voting for young people was really, really powerful because young people were saying, you know, over the last few months, we've been walking out of school, we've been participating in these marches, and, and the message was, now you vote, right? You march, you walk out, and now you vote. That is so interesting because I assumed it had a lot to do with the candidates running for Congress and sort of the anti-Trump uh, wave. So is that like a study or that you did, or how did, how did you kind of conclude that gun violence was the driver of of getting people, young people out to vote? Well, I think that, I think that, you know, we, I think the, the vote would have gone up if it was, you know, because of obviously Trump getting elected. And I think that a lot of young people have, um, that is, you know, got engaged sort of post the Women's March era. Um, but I think that what it is, is, you know, for young people, I mean, it's all of these things, right? It's, it's a culmination of so many of these different pieces. And um, I think that young people are really starting to understand that we do have a, vo a voice and that voice needs to transfer to the vote. Um, and I think that there's a narrative and there has been a narrative for so long that, you know, Gen Z, our generation, we're just obsessed with our phones and we are apathetic and we don't really care and so we start to believe that we start to internalize that as as what our you know what our generation is like we're nothing more than just you know phone obsessed teenagers um, and I think what the March for Our Lives movement did is it gave us something that sort of just turned that narrative you know 180 and said we are actually a generation that has the ability to join together and to use our collective power, to use our collective voice, to use our collective vote um, to, to make change. Um, uh, so funny, as I've been on book tour for this book, I went on Morning Joe on MSNBC and I was interviewed by, I think they were a range of like the end of, or the early part of Gen X. So I'm at like the tail end of Gen X, maybe millennial. I think maybe I'm on the line and then, and then boom, baby boomer. Um, interviewers and they kept trying to get me to say that Gen Z is horrible and that Gen Z is the source of like instant gratification culture and and all these problems and I kept feeling like that was a trap in our thinking to make this about one generation yes our culture is encouraging instant gratification but there's also this incredible looking forward among a lot of young people not universally of course but uh, I think it's really it's really an important in, in terms of like what narratives we're telling about young people and your point is really interesting that that can be self-reinforcing if you feel like no one else is mobilizing why mobilize yourself it's sort of a tragedy of the commons yeah i think i don't know if anyone saw it's been going around on social media as uh, a 25 year old uh new zealand um elected official uh said there was um uh she was giving a speech in, in parliament about climate change and um an older um other elected official um kind of made a comment and interrupted her speech and she said okay boomer um, and it's been going around on, on social media. Um, and I, there's a really interesting New York Times op-ed that came out yesterday that was talking about um, this like gener intergenerational war, or like putting it pitting generations against each other and saying like we need to blame each other as entire generations a to, to blame each other for the problems that are happening or the lack of solutions. Um, and uh, this was critiquing, critiquing that and saying, you know, no, that's not the, that's not what we, what we should be doing. We need to be talking about the people who are actually in power and have actually caused these issues and, and are failing to address them and failing to implement solutions. And that doesn't really affect, you know, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean it's a certain generation, um, but it's kind of coming from everyone and it's up to all of us to band together to, to address that. And I think that's what we did for the strikes was, you know, for the last year up until September 20th, the strikes were youth strikes. It was just youth striking. And for September 20th, we said, this is the time for adults to back us up. You know, we're not we're not, we know we can't do this alone. You know, Generation Z, we can't stand on our own and be like, this is, you know, we're, we're trying to fight this fight. We need every single generation. It has to be intergenerational. It has to be collaborative for us to actually create the change that we want to. And that's sort of, I feel like that's a, yeah. <laughs> that, and that stands out to me as sort of different than the 60s counterculture where it was sort of like, fuck the older people. They don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I hear that too from, 
from Gen Zers as well, and I take it in stride. Um, but I do, I do think there's something about that, and it also that means that we can't just dismiss you as sort of out there, you know, and too crazy for us. If you actually are asking us to be better ancestors, if you're asking us to do that and stand alongside you, um, then it becomes a different thing. It becomes sort of like an outstretching of a hand instead of a building of a wall, uh, which is, I think, something we need more of in this particular moment in general. Um, yeah, and so for me, this idea of becoming better ancestors sort of came about from getting in my early 30s a few years ago, getting a, a gift from uh, my great grandfather that was, I never met him. He was a music and art critic in India. And uh, this instrument that belonged to him was sort of a rare instrument that was handmade for him. And it was uh, passed down through my grandmother. So my grandmother gave it to me. And I had this instrument and I don't have children. I didn't have children at the time, but I suddenly felt like I had been given this object to shepherd through time. And because of my particular age, I wasn't quite thinking of myself as an ancestor. I wasn't quite thinking of my role in sort of the fabric of time, I was thinking about the span of my own life, maybe, and not even that far ahead, just sort of the span of the next 10 years. And so I thought about how this object really gave me a sense of an anchor to the future, right? And an ability to sort of imagine beyond my own lifetime, what will I do with this? You know, I'll probably pass it on to one of my nieces, but also a sense of belonging to the sort of history and past. And, and that, I feel, for me, has become a metaphor for thinking about some of these shared resources on the planet, like forests and like aquifers and farm farmland, fertile farmland, because it's not that we can make everything a shared heirloom or we can make everything an heirloom that we protect and pass down to the future because some things are going to disappear, some things are going to appear and, and time, you know, technology changes our society, remakes our society, but that there are certain precious objects sort of like this instrument. There are certain objects, resources, I would say, less than objects that we share that are sort of integral to human survival on the planet. And those include these natural resources that we've inherited and have the ability to pass on. So that um, that's sort of how I think about this and I think maybe is, is part of how I see my responsibility to you and to all the generations that come after you. I think we're supposed to go to questions now, so we will. Yeah, so you can go ahead and choose. Right here. Hi. Hello. Oh, you Thank you both. What if it's a long one? I'll keep it brief. Um, the <clears throat> Genuinely, thank you both. I, I, I love both of your bodies' work and very much appreciate them. When Greta uh, came up in the UN and um, her speech um, this past fall was very, very shame, shaming, right? I just couldn't help but think, would her message not be so much better received if it were to receive just a dose first of gratitude for the fact that the lives of young people right now are actually really rosy. We see nothing but standards of living increasing, um, lifespans increasing. Everything is really getting better. And frankly, that is all on the back end. Before you accuse me of being an oil man, uh, I run a company or a nonprofit called Climate Neutral. Anyway, this is on the backs of fossil fuels. And I wonder if delivering your message with a bit of gratitude for all the people in that industry would be helpful to your cause. Um, yeah, I think a couple things. I think, you know, first and foremost, we have to recognize always that when we talk about combating the fossil fuel industry, that we're not talking about the workers, that we're not talking about the people who are doing the everyday job. That's not who we're targeting. We're talking, talking about the people at the top who have the power to make those those decisions and that have the power and that have created this problem and, and would, if they were willing to be able to, to help implement solutions. Um, and I think, yes, in some ways, you know, the standard of living, as you said, you know, has improved for some. Um, and also the rate of suicide for young people is increasing. The rate of anxiety in young people are increasing. Um, I think, you know, it depends what communities you're talking about. Um, you know, the wealth gap is increasing. Um, and so I think, you know, we're looking around and saying, you know, yes, we all have smartphones in our back pocket. Uh, and we, you know, have the ability to fly around the world, um, you know, if that's what we want to do. Um, and, uh, you know, that is creating this extreme destruction. 
and long term is not rosy, right? You know, right now, yes, maybe in this moment for a lot of people, for some people, it feels that way, but it's not going to last very long. And we know that because, you know, last week, a lot of people in LA were had to leave their homes for risk of, of the wildfires. A lot of people lost their homes, lost their lives. And that, you know, that's not rosy. Um, and we know that that's going to get worse. And so, you know, we're not, we're not saying, oh, everything is horrible. And, you know, there's, there's no hope. It's, it's the exact opposite. It's, Every single person in this room, every single person who has ever lived, has gotten a chance to go outside and breathe fresh air and run around on clean grass. Um, and we don't know that that's going to exist for very much longer. We don't know that we're going to be able to pass that on to our kids. And so that's where the frustration comes from. That's where, you know, we say enough. You know, this isn't about hope. This isn't about trying to paint that, that rosy picture. It's saying this is the reality. This is where we are. And if we do not do anything, it will not get better. We've now passed 450 parts per million um, carbon in the atmosphere. The EPA has been decimated. Um, we're at a point where still 80% of uh, the electricity that's generated in this country is um, from fossil fuels. Um, would you not say that this is no longer about climate change, but about climate destruction? There needs to be a new word for it. And nothing short of a revolution <laughs> I, I hate to use the word, but it, it, it is what's called for now. I, I fear the world may not be here, although well, the earth will survive, but humans may not be able to survive in, in less than 100 years. It's not that maybe the ice caps will melt. They're melting. I mean, it's not that uh, maybe we'll see these super storms. We're seeing them. I'm done. <laughs> I think your sense of urgency is warranted. I think there is a sense that civilization is being remade already and that's certainly in the climate predictions and in fact a lot of these disasters are outpacing the previous expectations of previous predictions. I think we we also need to be a little bit careful about how we talk about civilization ending. So now I'm seeing a lot of nihilism emerging in this conversations talking about the narrative where people are saying, let's just accept that climate apocalypse is coming, including Jonathan Franzen recently in The New Yorker arguing for that. And if you look at the science, and if you look at uh, the evidence, there is never, there's not a binary movement moment in which we've lost this fight or lost this battle. There is always, it's always going to matter to cut emissions more. It's always going to matter to prepare more. So it's not, it's not the case that the incrementalism is meaningless. That said, uh, we're not making progress. We're not even making incremental progress at the moment. And I think the longer we wait, the more dramatic the actions seem to, that are warranted. And one thing I worry about in particular is do we get to a point where, you know, geoengineering seems like the only solution to, the, to this crisis because of where we are? Do we start doing really rash uh, um, sort of actions to respond to this because we're not acting in, in, in time. But I think another source of optimism for me is sort of understanding and studying sort of the history of social and political change and understanding that it's nonlinear. So the, the signs we see around us today of nothing changing on this issue or not enough changing on this issue are not necessarily dispositive of what's going to happen in the future. And if you look at these historic mobilizations, like what Katie has, has led with her colleagues, that we are reaching tipping points where we could have that kind of dramatic response politically and socially, which is, I think, fundamentally what we need in order to get the economic instruments and the technological instruments into place. And I would just add that, yes, we definitely need a revolution, and that's what we're working on building. <laughs> this question is for Katie, and I'm curious if you were to have... Hi, I'm, I'm uh, curious if you were to have a manifesto of what the vision could be from the youth movement, about how we could live, how we can live in a way that's just and equitable and healthy, what would that manifesto be? Because I think that this, this, this whole idea to stay away from the nihilism and to stay into the optimism is about vision. And I would love to know what the youth vision is. Um, 
Yes. Um, so first, there's an amazing video that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did um, where she sort of painted this watercolor um, picture of what she wanted it to be. And it's an amazing video. So if you haven't checked it out, you should watch it. Um, but that's actually something that we spend a lot of time doing and talking about. We did a retreat uh, in August in Iowa um, with 50 youth climate organizers from across the country. And the first exercise we did was, what do you want our, your future to look like? Um, and from that conversation came the demands that we have for the climate strike. There are five demands. I won't run through them because it would take a long time. But um, you know, when we talk about the future that we want to live we, uh, in and the, what we're actually fighting for. You know, why are we doing this? What are we trying to protect? Um, it is one that looks much more just and much more equitable. You know, we center environmental justice as the core of what we're talking about. We don't talk about, we are not climate activists anymore. We are climate justice activists. But you, because you cannot talking about addressing the climate crisis without talking about who is affected first and who is affected most. Um, we need to talk about respecting indigenous land and indigenous sovereignty and acknowledge that you know our indigenous um, brothers and sisters have been the people who have been, yes, have been leading this movement from the beginning and need to continue to be at the forefront. Because when we talk about restoring the relationship between nature and the earth and 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 people, you know, indigenous folks have been doing that for forever, uh, and so they need to lead us in in that restoration. And I think um, I think that's at the core of it. Of is what we're what 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 is our vision? It's you know we are we are you know there's. Um, when we talk about, you know, we're not, oh, what, I'm forgetting where this is coming from now, but it's, um, you know, we don't, uh, we don't inherit the land from our ancestors, we borrow it from future generations. Um, and I think that that is what we need to, that is how we should be living. And we need to, um, you know, we need to reestablish that, that relationship with nature and with the earth. And that is going to help us reestablish the relationships with other people and other people who are different from us and 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 really talking about kind of that full-fledged transition um, in into the future that we want to live in. Okay, we have so many questions. Maybe the one right here behind, right just behind you with the mic. So I'm really interested in the idea of inviting generational conversation and with your new position coming up. So what if we all accepted the responsibility when we are having discussions with business owners that we invite them as part of their strategic planning to say, how are you gonna prepare for your next climate event? To invite that as part of the yearly strategic plan as, as one of the best practices. And I think that could be um, one way to get people who otherwise are, are very siloed in their own business and their own world to invite the younger employees, the, the people who are retiring, those in leadership, all to come together to discuss not only preparing for the climate event as far as risk or threat management, but also opportunity. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And uh, some of the examples you'll see in the second section of that book um, are about just how we get, how, how in a business do you get people to think ahead when you know it's driven by the quarterly profit or the near-term stock price, like how do you actually orient within a company? Because it's rewarding for the business leaders too, to be able to think down the road and it's in their interest ultimately. Uh, it might not be in the short-term stockholders' interest, but it is in the ultimate interest uh, to be looking at these long-term threats and opportunities because frankly, there's investment opportunities. Climate change could be a huge opportunity space for so many businesses and it obviously is for some obvious ones like solar. So thanks for the comment. and. I think there's there was a hand here. This that is I the said last. The uh, one more question. Oh no! So. Okay. So, hold on. I have a mic coming your way. She's had her hand up for a while. Yeah. And then, if anybody wants me to sign a book, I will I do that in the lobby for to whoever. Um, Hi, I'm I'm in uh, uh, I'm Asha. I'm from Palo Alto, yeah. California. I'm in venture capital, and we've been actually, you know, a lot of us in in the venture world are trying to you know, sort of move from the regular venture model, as you said, sort of quarterly profits model to something which is more long term and be able to put a, a correct pricing, right? So instead of saying non-profit, we are saying social profit, uh, things like that. And just really sort of try getting people to shift their mindset on what is it that we are valuing and what is it that we are valuing as a public good, for example. How do we put the right pricing on it? Is, is something there in your book that you see uh, that we can refer to. And do you see anything in the future that venture capitalists can get engaged with? Um, you know, I, 
I was trying to look for, you know, some things that we, we could work with. But a lot of the times people, especially from things like foundation and large foundations, they tell us we will participate if you put, uh, if you put your, your funding into things which are, uh, you know, going to make like, a, which are going to make a, you know, that will that will sort of sorry, so sorry. Okay. That will change the you know. It make a big big difference, basically. I don't Thank know what you. To... Yeah, I think a lot of this has to do with metrics and sort of well, to one degree, time horizons and another metrics. So, as an investor, what are the metrics you're looking at, and on what time horizon are you measuring them? And if you're only looking at immediate metrics and you're not choosing milestones of sort of future value, it's going to be very hard for you to ignore sort of the noise that happens as a company tries to build something that matters. And so uh, a lot of uh, some of the stories, I, it's all story based. So some of the stories I tell are about investment firms, about companies that manage to pick measures that are actually about the value they're creating over time. And I think that very much links to whether you're going to be able to have the patience to invest in something that has a has a longer payoff. And then I think in some instances it's 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 about portfolio because maybe you can't tolerate that kind of long-term risk for everything in your portfolio, but there's some sort of regular staple of steady returns from over here that can subsidize that sort of longer term thinking. I'm giving a very short answer just because we're running out of time, but um, hopefully you'll find something interesting. I'm happy to connect otherwise. It sounds like that was our last question, but Katie, you are so inspiring and I'm so happy that we got to be in conversation. Uh, thank you. And thanks to you all for being here. Yeah, thank let's you give so a big much, round of applause well. to our incredible panelists.